just to filter their way back for the next set of talks. Um, we are now going to have a presentation from um, Dave and Ed talking about the new Muldraw 2D features. Uh, and then that will be followed by our next, the third lightning session. So that'll be six talks in a row. Um, Dave, Ed, take it away. Thank you, Greg, uh, and thank you for um, inviting us to, to talk about our work this morning. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so I'm Ed Griffin, and Dave Cosgrove is also on the line. Um, I'm going to do the right, you should be seeing, hopefully you can now see our presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about efficiently delivering better molecule descriptions. Um, I'm doing the why and the what, and then Dave's taken over for the uh, the actual how. Uh, so um, I work for a little company called Medchemica. Uh, we deliver software to customers of all sizes. Um, we also do uh, Medchem services. And if you want to hear about what we're doing for COVID, then um, follow that Twitter tag because there's lots of exciting stuff and a huge number of people have contributed. And I'm not going to say any more about that now, but it's uh, hugely exciting. So let's talk about um, molecule depiction. Um, so for about 12 years, I was a technical interviewer for AstraZeneca. And uh, chemists care a lot about how they draw molecules. And I came to the conclusion in my my technical interviewing career that actually the first question I needed to ask someone was draw me cyclohexane. Um, because if you get this as the answer, uh, you know you're going to have a pretty, as an interviewer, you know then the next half hour is going to be fairly hard work. This is probably going to be the question, what else could you draw? This is a start. This is slightly worrying. This is shows somebody who understands what we're talking about. And the person who asks you boat or chair, you know you're probably going to have quite an enjoyable time as an interviewer. Um, and what I'm trying to get at is that organic, organic chemists judge each other actually on the quality of their chemical drawing, because it isn't a drawing in the sense of a piece of artwork. It's a precise chemical description um, that conveys a whole lot of useful information. I'm going to... Uh, Go to the, that's better. So um, equally, if we produce software that poorly depicts molecules at the first impression, no matter how good the underlying algorithms are in our software, and, and they are really quite good, um, people will, their immediate impression is there is something wrong. And that's just their intuition coming into place. So we had for about six months to a year, when we've been using RD kit depictions, we, we had an argument about that there's kind of quite a lot of things that are nasty or were because they've really improved. Um, and so what we needed was, uh, can I move the, uh, where did I, anyway, what we needed, this is our, our own internal GitHub site. So we were seeing things like clipping of structures, um, heteroatoms kind of in the wrong place, or rather the protons on heteroatoms in the wrong place or the wrong way around. Um, scaling of structures was kind of difficult. We'd like to be able to orientate molecules uh, easily. Um, when you're doing smart highlighting, when you do one smart on one structure is pretty straightforward. But when you've got two smart patterns hitting the same atom, that gets hard to see. And if you've got things that are going two ways around a ring, again, that can be difficult. There are problems about chiral depiction and the depiction of smirks is again a little bit worrying. So we went through a process of actually prioritizing what we thought that the kind of worst problems were. Um, and I'd like to emphasize this was a really important process for when we then decided to, to tackle the problem. And let me explain or show you some examples of what these look like so that you can actually visualize them. So this is clearly this hydrogen should be below the nitrogen. This bounding box has correctly 
got the NH, but the fact that this is highlighted is now being clipped. This hydrogen should be above and there's really much too much chirality here. And this hydrogen probably should be somewhere else. Um, this is kind of a really quite a severe problem. So that's one set of problems. Um, other offences that we should consider. So this is particularly bad. So this is a snapshot taken from uh, one of our pieces of software that doesn't look like this anymore because it's been improved. Um, but you can see here that we have, as the size of the molecule changes, we've got three different sizes of structure. And that, to a chemist at first glance, just makes this quite hard to pass. So we wanted that cleaned up and there's the bounding box problem and the NH problem. So this is, these are all nice real life molecules that chemists would be interested in. Um, as for the Smirks depiction problem, um, so there's a, a well characterized Smirks, aromatics, aliphatics, who would know? Um, this, is, this is not really a great depiction of a Smirks. So this gives you an idea of the kinds of things that we wanted to address. Uh, so at this stage, uh, oh, one more. Yeah, so here's the, the SMARTS problem. So you want to see NCO and NCC. Um, and these were a couple of really literally crude sketches about different ways of visualizing this. Um, this because I'm a Londoner by birth and I like Tokyo is we like this because it's when you put this up people kind of intuitively know how to interpret it because lots of people have traveled on public transport in various cities so that that was one of the reasons for thinking about this okay um so what were we going to do about it now that first step actually know what you want to do so it took us quite a while to get our our prioritization of what mattered most. Um, and before any code got written, we then went to talk to Greg. And even more importantly, uh, listen to what he says. So listen to the feedback, because getting the API right, if you're going to make some changes um, in the RD kit, matters. And then having done those things, get it out in the open. So post an issue on the RD kit GitHub repo and look at the responses. So this is like listening to Greg, but more so. Um, adapt and build on the best ideas. So lots of people take the obvious example of you know, the benefit of open source software. Is it being free and, and accessible and portable? But actually, because you can crowdsource ideas and solutions early, we were quite open to the fact that we hadn't got all the best ideas of how to fix this or even what the most important things necessarily were um, and what else could be fixed. So having more input early on um, was a real benefit. And that, as we'll see later, enabled some extensions to our ideas to be, uh, to be put in place. So um, I thought I'd, this works. Actually, let's show you what that looks like. So here is, um, the proposed improvements. Um, so Dave put this up 4th February last year um, with all the everything I've gone through with examples, um, some kind of discussion and some feedback from Greg and some more feedback from Greg and some extensions about how it could be better. Um, some discussion about how the API could work, a bit of support for uh, highlighting and some discussion. And here come our attempts to rough something up um, and which way we're going to go. And Brian pitched in and I pitched in a bit as well. Um, and more chat. So there's and closed because in the end the work was done. So let's go back to the the presentation. So that gives you an idea of actually what we were going to do. And at this point, uh, I'm going to pass over to Dave, who's going to explain how the work was actually done. Dave, okay. now, take it away. Okay. 
don't know if you can hear me okay, hopefully. Uh, so uh, I was obviously also from AstraZeneca, worked with Ed for a long time, and since I was made redundant, I was contracting, writing code for money in the cheminformatics field. So Ed came to me and said, this is what we want. Can you do it for us? So we haggled a bit on timescales and stuff, and uh, off we went. And, and the first thing was to fix the clipping. Uh, the diagnosis turned out to be quite straightforward because um, the, uh, the scale that uh, maps the atom coordinates onto the drawing canvas uh, was taking no notice of the text or the highlighting at all. It just used the atom coordinates and then it uh, worked out the scale, then reduced the scale by 95%, crossed its fingers and hoped for the best. And as we've seen, this hope was from time to time rather disappointing. Um, so the obvious thing to do was to, as part of the, the scale calculation, to pre-format the strings and the highlights, work out how much space they were going to occupy on the canvas, and take factor that in as well. Obviously, that's kind of a circular thing because you don't know how big the text is going to be until you've worked out the scale. And once you've uh, changed the scale, obviously the, the size of the text and the highlights changes again. So you have to go around a couple of times till it's all consistent. And also this fix then depends on other things to do with how the, uh, the strings are going to be drawn afterwards, which was the second thing I was tackling. So um, it was pretty fiddly. It required quite a lot of pre-factoring of the code because the drawing of the strings was buried down deep in the class structure, and I had to haul bits of it back up into the uh, into the main class to get at the uh, the rectangles around all the strings. But uh, that was relatively straightforward. Have the next slide, please. Uh, fixing the text was a bit more fiddly. Um, the text was currently just being centered as a single string on the atom coordinates, which, uh, as Ed has pointed out, led to some fairly horrible things. There was already code in the, uh, um, in the drawer to work out which way the text should point, north, south, east, and west, but uh, it wasn't actually being used at this point, and uh, it needed a fair amount of tweaking as well. But the rules it finally decided on uh, Atoms of degree one are always east or west, as you can see from the hydroxyls uh, around the left-hand side of that thing. Um, atoms with more than two bonds going into them, it uh, takes the average vector of the, uh, from the bonded atoms to the atom, and that gives you a single vector pointing pretty much the way the text needs to go. So as Ed's pointing out the NH there, that goes west. Uh, and on the other side, the, the other NH goes east. Um, the vector obviously points a bit down, a bit south, but uh, we're just going to then clip it back up to north, south, east, or west. And then the same with the amide at the bottom, which goes north. A slightly uh, uh, interesting wrinkle, which of course didn't, uh, didn't show up until the, the code was out in the world, is that if you have uh, an atom of degree three with a hydrogen on it, such as that uh, protonated amine, you have to make sure the H doesn't go on top of the bond north of the nitrogen. But you know these things are that's why you test code and uh, the joy of open source is that someone will find these things for you so uh, how we lay out the text it's uh, it's a bit fiddly um, because people are very fussy about where their pluses go and stuff like that but basically you take the long string and the text comes in as that long thing with markup for subscripts and superscripts uh, split it into tokens based so that an atom and all its subscripts and superscripts is drawn in one block. Um, and then you take the bounding rectangle about each. Put the first token at the atom coordinates centered there, uh, so the nitrogen in this case. And then uh, we're going north in this case, so you go up the drawing a bit to draw the H2 plus uh, and then justify it. Um, left or right, so that the H is over the N and not just centered on the middle of the uh, vector up from the N. And if you're doing west orientation, you have to draw it all backwards. But Brian likes his plus not quite like that. So that was a very fiddly thing to uh, try and get the plus back to the, uh, the end of the string again in some cases. But um, so that always uh, sorted out quite nicely, I think. And then moves on to the next thing. So next slide. Uh, the 
brief was for two color highlights, but why why stop at two? Uh, the discussion in the issue tracker, we decided that we'd go with the tube map style rather than lasso. It's uh, it's quite a nice, easy thing to understand, I think, and actually, in terms of programming, it's a lot easier. Which of course, uh, when you're on a meter, uh, makes a difference to people. Uh, so I think practically four colors is probably the limit. Um, it just gets very complicated, very congested otherwise, but uh, I'm not showing it. So it's just a matter of drawing a circle of the appropriate radius around the atoms, dividing it up into segments for the number of colors, uh, and then drawing bars parallel to the bonds um, as, as required. And the only slightly fiddly bit is having to calculate the intersection between the lines and the circles. Uh, which is not a difficult piece of maths, but it's, uh, it's uh, painful enough that uh, you can crowdsource that as well. Stack Overflow knows everything. You just put into Google that uh, formally or code for intersection of a line and a circle, and you can find five different bits of code to, to rip off. I actually found some C sharp in the end, but uh, turned it into a useful language uh, on the way. Uh, so that was all uh, relatively straightforward to do, although placing an ellipse turned out to be a bit fiddly. Uh, and so to give you an idea of what, why you might want to do this, uh, this is it, uh, uh, three Pharma 4 features mapped onto morphine, showing that you know features overlap, and so it's useful to be able to show that. So there's the, uh, the RR ring and, uh, and, and the base three bonds to the RR ring, and then the, it's pretty congested picture, but then uh, morphine is a difficult thing to draw in, in 2D because it's an inherently 3D structure. Um, but yeah, you can see all the overlapping. So that all worked pretty well. So go on to the next slide, please. So one of the bonuses of uh, uh, having a chat to Greg before doing all this was he said, oh, actually, I've got a requirement for adding arbitrary strings uh, of annotation to atoms and bonds. Got some funding for that. I don't know where that came from. Um, uh, it was something he wasn't particularly excited about doing himself, so he asked me if I could fit that in as well. Um, so that was an extra thing. Um, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, the two obvious examples that uh, we put in as canned options in the draw options uh, object is that you can annotate your atoms and bonds by sequence number and by the stereo information uh, R and S and. Uh, E for E or Z for, for double bonds. So that's all was fun. So I don't think I've got time to bore you with the algorithm of how that's doing, so for how that's done. So for Ed, you can skip the next two slides. They're there if you want to do them, if you want to bore yourself later. Uh, whilst I was in the code, uh, there were a couple of small issues floating around on the GitHub that uh, I thought I might as well tackle at the same time. So I lobbed those in for free. Uh, one of them is putting dots around uh, Brand radicals, um, as you can see there. I probably should put a small string underneath there to show that these are all. Uh, this is a structure that's missing hydrogens. Um, and, and the other thing someone had asked for was the ability to put a, a new line into a legend on a molecule. Um, and whilst I was doing that, I, it uh, it was never adjusting the font to fit nicely. So uh, so it now adjusts the font size uh, so that this string should fit in the uh, across the uh, the bottom of the of the drawing panel. Um, so that was all very good. Uh, come to the next slide, please. Uh, went into the 202003 release, and Greg put a blog post, post up about it, and Taka did something similar in his rather excellent blog. And I'm afraid I ignored every, all the wise words everyone would read, and I went straight to the pictures, and I went, got my red pen out, and went, oh, God, that, that amine linker. The bond doesn't go up to the nitrogen probably, possibly chlorophenol and uh, those amino acids. Uh, Firefox doesn't show a subscript properly. That's just a bug in Firefox with its SVG. Yeah. Um, the renderer, Safari does that bit right, but for some reason the oxygen is floating off into the ether somewhere. Um, the uh, nitrogens and those cyano groups are kind of poorly placed. And the, uh, the circles and ellipses around the highlighting on the top two uh, pictures uh, left and right there. Really, 
not very well placed at all there. In the, in the top right, the circles are crossing over the, uh, the hydroxyl group and the amine is just not sort of, uh, yeah, That's all pretty disappointing, really. Um, so the next slide. Uh, to come. So the problem is, uh, is that uh, in both SVG and Cairo, when you ask how big a letter is, it just gives you um, the same height for all of them. And, uh, and that height has to take into the fact that some letters go below the line, so G and Y, and some letters are taller than others, that sort of thing. It makes it very difficult to lay out uh, the characters um, precisely on the thing. And it also means that the SVG and Cairo pictures look a bit different. And as we've seen, SVG in different browsers is also difficult, which is pretty irritating. Um, so, so that's where I was, um, kind of end of March, early April. And then a, a lucky thing happened, of course, that uh, COVID hit the world. And I was between contracts, uh, which I tried to arrange for the summer. Normally, I would have spent a lot of time on holiday and riding my bike around the Peak District, which is lovely. None of these things were an option to me, so you think, well, oh, I've got all this spare time. Why don't I go and fix all these horrible problems in the drawings? So, so a result for, for COVID, uh, I suppose. So I had a chat with Greg to see what he thought about this, because obviously that's the first thing you do, and he went, well, there's no way I'm going to do that. So, uh, so if you want to have a go, knock yourself out. Um, so we decided to have a look at FreeType, which is a C library. Uh, for which is all open source, freely available, still maintained, works on Mac Linux and Windows, and it's basically just a good way of, uh, of rendering fonts uh, in a fairly um, open-ended way. And then there's a number of places you can find open source fonts on the web. Open Foundry is the one which I think I may have used. Um, it's a slightly awkward user interface, but uh, you can get the hold of the fonts uh, quite easily. So we've gone to the next slide. Uh, so to implement it, uh, the text drawing at that point was quite embedded in the mold draw 2D objects that you're all familiar with. So I pulled it all out into a set of classes. There's an abstract base class called draw text, uh, which defines the interface and does some of the basic setup stuff. I put two concrete classes underneath that, draw text Cairo and draw text SVG, which uh, use the native drawing um, uh, systems, um, pretty much as was already there in the code, although I did fiddle it a bit uh, so that it does things like gets the subscript right uh, in uh, Firefox and stuff like that. And then from that, I derived another abstract base class, draw text FT which is the free type implementation of this. And underneath there, there's the two Cairo and SVG equivalents. And then uh, a bit later on, once all this was up and, and in the repo, Greg did the same for JavaScript and free type JavaScript so that uh, in minimal lib, uh, you would also get uh, the same pictures there as well. So that was all pretty nice. So next slide, please. Uh, so how's it done? FreeType does all the uh, character or all the cons and glyphs. Um, you just give it uh, callbacks for your particular drawing libraries. And you need uh, four uh, functions to do that. One that just moves the drawing cursor to a particular position. One that draws a straight line from that position. Uh, and then there are two Bezier functions for drawing curves. Uh, a, uh, a quadratic one and a cubic one. And both the SVG and the Cairo libraries all have, obviously have uh, functions for doing that. Although one of them doesn't have the quadratic function, but uh, of course, someone on Wikipedia has produced the function for, or the formula for converting a quadratic into a cubic. So uh, you just promote it like that uh, within your drawing code. It all works nicely. Uh, so next slide. Um, so in the abstract base class, it loads the font uh, as required, calculates the rectangles around all the glyphs, uh, and you can get very precise information about that. Draws the strings using the free type callbacks, and we've hard coded in the telex font uh, just because I looked at a few and it seemed okay. Um, and then each of the uh, concrete classes then implements those four callback functions in its own API. 
a slightly uh, interesting wriggle wrinkle because, of course, uh, three types of C API are you get C++. So you can't use class member functions directly as the callback functions because of the hidden this uh, variable that goes into the class member functions. Um, <clears throat> so the solution to that is you can uh, smuggle user data into the uh, into the free type function. Okay, Greg, and um, uh, you then uh, cast that back to uh, to the draw text ft class, and then the virtual function. Uh, the object-oriented magic occurs, and then it goes off and uses the right class function. So that was all pretty straightforward, and it does mean that uh, implementing uh, a new uh, uh, a new class for your own drawing library, as Greg can attest, is relatively straightforward. So we had some fun with positive y, which I won't, don't really have time to go into now, but it did make my life a bit kind of frustrating, kind of middle of June time, a great deal of banging my head. Um, so I go on to the, uh, the thing that everyone cares about. You can put your own font in if you want to. And this is, uh, for test purposes, I included the Amadeus font, which is a particularly ridiculous thing. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you can see it's quite a straightforward thing. You just, in the, the more draw options for your thing, you just tell it where the font file is of interest. And you too can have a picture using the XKCD uh, font if you so wish, or uh, if you want to know what the bright orange kids are taking this season, that's it in Blade Runner font. Uh, so on to the next slide. Uh, so where are we? And I've been amusing myself the last two days looking at people's slides going, oh, that's an old version, or that slide's obviously quite out of date, just by looking at the quality of the drawings. And you can see, I think things have moved on quite a lot. And this, so the bottom is what you'll be getting in 2019 and key things like the subscripts and the superscripts go on top of each other and the bonds don't clash and uh, as Ed says, if NH points the right way. Uh, so I think at that point I can hand back to him to round things up. Okay, I will slickly get to an end. So we learned some good things about this. Um, key talked to Greg early, so we actually talked to Greg um, at the 2019 UGM, so just a year ago, and then post it as an issue. Um, we have to be very focused because we're a small business. Um, but one of the positives is you can have changes done quite efficiently, uh, particularly when you do all this pre-work. That's, that's, remember this bit, okay? Uh, because from 2019 UGM, it was live in the 2020-03 release. So that was, that was pretty good. But we did learn some things, as Dave would attest. Um, testing early and testing often is really, really important. Get into your testing cycle as quick as you can. And the corollary of that is don't do any more until you've got the basics fully tested. We won't discuss that, but um, that was one of the consequences. Um, do, as, do as we say, not as we did. Um, this is Dave's comment. Um, hey, it was fine for me, well, fixed price. Um, yeah, that's, that's our learning. Um, real learning is will we do this again absolutely we have a list of stuff that we would like to do it was very efficient use of our time and money to make improvements to a non-ip sensitive part of our code base and you know we didn't write this use it and then think should we outsource it we thought or outplace it we thought straight away this is going in the rd kit um we see this as kind of a an honor thing um we use the rd kit it's part of our underlying toolkit that we make available to customers and so we contribute to its extension. Uh, that seems like the right thing to do to us. Um, Acknowledgements, uh, really appreciate all the feedback from Greg and Brian. Um, Al, who is one of the other MedChemica directors, put a lot of input into this as well. And actually all the complaining chemists who said, um, please, that's a horrible structure, make it better because it hurts our eyes. Uh, because we do actually want to get across the underlying algorithms we use in a sensible way to these people so that they can hopefully make better molecules. I think that's probably us out of time. Is that us? Good, Greg. Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, there's a fair amount of, I don't want to say questions, there's a fair amount of silliness, particularly silliness from the dinosaurs, and I, uh, I include myself in the class of dinosaurs. Dave, you fall in that category too. 
Um, in Discord, which is worth taking a look at, there actually is a real question um, from Eduardo, wondering if the, for the highlights, if the opacity and width of the highlight can be changed. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think so either. I was just looking at the code. Um, that would be something we could think about for the future. Um, otherwise, there are some, and there actually are some real suggestions in there too, as well as some positive feedback. So it's worth taking a look at. Okay. Thank you guys.